we'll have a few more people join us as you go. And that's great. Um, and we'll just kind of do a uh, slow step by step call to worship and phase in. But uh, for those of you that are on now and can hear me, uh, we're going to read uh, from Psalm 118 together. And so you might do what you need to do to grab a, your Bible or pull it up on your other end of your screen or your Bible app. And mm -hmm. we're going to, we're going to worship this morning, if not through song and music, <laughs> excuse me. Um, Lord, save me from a coughing attack. Uh, we're going to worship this morning through um, the reading of the Lord's word. Amen. And that will be uh, as good as it gets. So we're going to we're going to look at Psalm 118 here in a few minutes. And because we are the body of Christ, each member has a different function. We operate as a body. Uh, we're going to take turns reading. And so Psalm 118, if you take a look at that, um, we're going to have. I probably have each of you read two different times, one verse at a time. Um, there are twenty-nine <laughs> verses, so if we do the math, we can we can read all of it. Um, and so I'm going to be assigning that, and I feel like back in my football coaching days, but um, we'll we'll definitely make this happen. So um, let's do that right now. I will take. <laughs> You can just start. Oh, man, we, we can almost have enough for everybody doing verse. I'll take verse one. And again, and again the scripture reference. Psalm 118. We'll read uh, all of Psalm 118. Uh, we'll take turns reading it together. We'll each take a verse. Um, let's see. That's going to be hard to do, Rock. Yeah. <laughs> you're, going to, you're going to get him a sign. Yeah. Rock, I'm going to assign them right read now. read the verse and then call out the next person. Yes. We're not all in the same order on our screen. So you read a verse and then call out the next person to read. And I got it. So let's do it this way. I've got verse one. Um, who would like verse two? Raise your hand. Punch, pop, kick. Okay. So Barb will have verse two. You remember your verse. Verse three. That should be Aaron. Yeah, I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> verse three. <laughs> verse four. Martha. 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 Five. I'll do five. Who? Grace. Grace. Six. I'll do six. Brenda. Yep. Seven. Ooh. Kevin. Six, six is Brenda. Who's seven? Kevin. Marvin. Kevin can be seven. Jeff Miller's got seven, eight. <clears throat> How many verses? Got eight. Dina. Dina, I've got you on verse three. Let's let's get there through everybody. You do? Sam Ross, you got eight. I'm, You're on mute. Give me a thumbs up. <laughs> Let's see. Tim, Tim Ross, you got verse eight. Verse nine. Marvin. Marvin's got nine. Ten. Carla. Carla has ten. Eleven. Kevin, eleven. Kevin, eleven. <laughs> Twelve. Ray. Thirteen. Thirteen for me, Barbara. Barbara Bettis. Okay, fourteen. I can do it. Who? Uh, Caleb. Caleb's got... 14, 15. Cindy. 16. We can swing I'll back. Megan, you want to do 16 for us? Okay. 16, Ooh. Megan. 17. Dan Hammer. Dan, 18. Steve, you got 18? 18. 18. Steve Reams has 18. Steve Re Steve McCracken, you got 19. Steve 
Where is he? I'll I think do it. I give you 19. Who's that? Ooh. Tim, uh, Caleb's dad. Beautiful. <laughs> Twenty. I'll do twenty. Twenty-one. I'll do twenty-one. Oh. Martha's got twenty-one. Twenty-two. Me. Who's me? Kim. Kim's got twenty-two. Twenty-three. Don'll do it. <laughs> okay, twenty-four. Good one, Cindy. <laughs> We're almost there, you guys. Tamara. Okay. Tamara, 24. Tamara. Tamara, 25. Yeah. Ray, was that you? I was trying to volunteer Aaron. Ah, so you are Aaron Habit, 26. We can do repeats. Grace, you got 26. Okay. Dina, you got 27. Sure. I hope you're all writing this down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 28. <laughs> I'll do 28. Do we have any Tim kids? 28. Tim, you also have an earlier verse, I think, eight or nine. Yeah, I'm good on eight and 28. All right, and I'll take the last first verse and the last <laughs> verse. All right. Well, that took, hey. okay. that took a bit, but we got her done. Hey, good job I, at doing I, Psalm 119. All right. <laughs> Are we yeah, all really? on the same version? No. And that's okay. Uh, okay. We're not all on the same version. That is all right. Um, so let us pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that this is the day that you've made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you, Father, that your mercies are new every morning. We see the freshness of the snow and we are not overwhelmed or intimidated or daunted. We thank you, Father, for this, this time. We thank you that we are your church. We are your people. You delight in us. You call us your own. You are our beloved and we are yours. And we now give up <laughs> ourselves and our time to you as we gather together, being able to just sit in our homes. We're thankful for that. And so now, Father, we each of us uh, agree together to set aside this time for you. Yeah. With reverence, without rigidity, but with reverence. And we thank you, Father, that you would release in us a spirit of joy, a spirit of thanksgiving and praise. And we look forward to being together now, to hearing your word, to hearing from you, and to hearing from you through one another. And so we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hear now the word of the Lord. Amen. Psalm 118, verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say his faithful love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his love endures forever. In my distress, I prayed to the Lord, and the Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who worship me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. It is better to trust the Lord than to put confidence in people. Better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Though hostile nations surround me, I destroyed them all with the authority of the Lord. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I will certainly fend, fend them off. They swarmed around me like bees. 
They blazed against me like a crackling fire, but I destroyed them all with the authority of the Lord. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Yes. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Verse 17, I will not die, but I will live and proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. Those gates are the way into the presence of the Lord, and the godly enter there. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is wonderful to see. Mute, unmute. No, that's me. No. <laughs> this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join us in festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Therefore, Father, we together give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, mm -hmm. and his love, love endures, endures forever. 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 Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. So as we continue just in our time of uh, un uncharacteristic worship, but worship nevertheless, I want to invite each of you and all of you to... Uh, to give a praise and thanksgiving to the Lord on what you're especially thankful for right now as you've read and heard the reading of Psalm 118. As you think about this last week since we last met last Sunday, how have you experienced the goodness of the Lord this week and even now and today? I invite you to share. Remember to unmute. I just like to give thanks. Um, we have a wonderful neighbor with a snowblower who has come over repeatedly, totally cleared all rocks in our driveway. And then also uh, our daughter, Debbie, son in law, Ryan, just really been taking good care of us. Oh. And uh, Shelly was here visiting for a little while too. So we've been well cared for in these last few weeks. And just Lord has blessed us mightily. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Well, we've had a bit of an adventure in the last week. We lost a friend, um, but we were able to travel to Oregon uh, to be there for her funeral and to be with um, several other friends. Many came to honor her life. Um, and it felt like Kevin was saying on our way home that it felt like one last parting gift from her that we were able to be together and to grieve together and to celebrate her life. Um, and it was really hard, but it was really a blessing that we were able to be a part of that. And we didn't know if we were going to be able to go until the last minute. The pass was closed. Mm. And the Lord, we just felt like he said, I'm going to make the way clear. And he did. He got us there and he got us home before the storm. And uh, we're just really grateful for his protection over us. Um, and just the gift of being able to grieve 
mm. as family. Mm. God woke us up at four o'clock in the morning to come back here. And if any of you know Dina, getting up at four <laughs> o'clock in the morning is <laughs> it, had be, it had to be a God thing. So we were on the road by 530. Um, yeah. I think we are learning. Thank you so much, Dina and Kevin. I think we're learning together as a congregation. Not that we just began to learn this, but as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, as he described some of his hardships, he described it like this. Sorrowful or mourning, yet always rejoicing. <clears throat> that it's not either or, it's both and. Sorrowful and yet we're always rejoicing. Yeah, we're learning how to do that in our families and as a congregation. Thank you, Dina. Who else has a praise or a Thanksgiving? I have a praise. Oops. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. They've got you. Well, anyway, um, at Christmas, my youngest sister, she got became extremely ill. And they tested her for RSV, COVID, whatever. And it all tested negative. But she was so severely ill, they thought she had pneumonia and she didn't. But today, she is on her way to recovery. She crested over and we're all rejoicing and thanking the Lord. Yes. So, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for hearing. Tomorrow is Jude's birthday, and um, I just praise God for allowing him to be a part of our family. And I remember driving through an ice storm from North Carolina to Georgia this night to be there for his birth on the 15th and what what a blessing to be there when my son was born and mm -hmm. not have to do all the hard work um, <laughs> I don't think very many women get the opportunity to enjoy a child coming into the world that way and knowing that that child will be a part of their family forever. It's pretty mm -hmm. amazing, but I'm just praising God for the <laughs> wonderful child that Jude is, even though 12 was hard and I anticipate 13 is going to be harder. Um, still <laughs> just really rejoicing that he is ours and we get to live this life with him. I just, I've just been uh, th this week just uh, rejoicing in uh, with with so many negative things going on that uh, just to see God working um, day to day, He's faithful, um, and just. Um, I'm just so thankful that uh, we don't have to get bogged down in the negative. And he, he's as he's as much at work right now as, as he ever has been. Um, I'll share. A, um. Another birthday, um, our daughter is 35 today. What does that say about us? <laughs> um, I remember when I turned 35, I thought I was middle-aged. And um, now my perception of that has totally changed. But um, we just are blessed by her. Amen. <laughs> I'd like to um, <clears throat> share something that also involves, involves Carla Wood. Um, last fall, some of you know um, that we basically have a set of counselors for physicians um, where I work, Ada County Medical Society, and I stay in contact with those counselors. And one of them um, 
that I spoke with last fall had developed a neurogenic cough, meaning that she coughed all the time. And she was so sad because she said, I don't know if I can, can continue my counseling practice. I can't talk. My, I get laryngitis. And I said, well, you know, can I pray for you? And I prayed for her. And I said, and can I send somebody your way who's had a similar type of thing? Because I was thinking of Carla and the, the difficulties she had with her voice over the years. And so Carla ended up connecting with her. Uh, thank you, Carla. And really ministered Jesus to her. And I spoke with that counselor this week because I hadn't for a few months. And uh, she said, first of all, thank you for connecting me to Carla. That, that some of the things that she and a few others shared with me, my cough is getting better. I'm dealing with that. And I'm praying for Carla because I know that she's had some issues lately. And then, and then she said something to me that for me was just, you know, an affirmation. She said, and you made that connection, Steve. You know, and there's, there's times where I feel at work, you know, am I doing the Lord's work here? Am I making a difference here or not? And for someone to, to tell me that that connection, she said, this is life changing, that connection that you made. Mm -hmm. And so big shout out for Carla for following through and in, in boldness, just sharing her faith with her. Um, you know, I think there's a person of peace that there's maybe a more opportunity for us to begin to disciple remotely. She doesn't even live in Boise. So I don't know, Carla, um, thank you. I just want to shout out to you for your obedience in that too. Steve, it's so. So amazing that you shared that today because I don't even know how to describe how I feel right now, but um, I've just been trying. I don't, I have unknowns with my health right now with my lungs and my breathing problems, and I'm trying to just be really patient in the waiting, but. I'm doing this spiritual authority class and I'm, we're just starting the physical healing work behind mm. where you guys were. And I just, I just don't even know how to pray anymore. And um, mm. I know up here that God is working. I just feel like I've lacked faith. So you just developed my faith today. So thank you. Mm. Mm. Why is it easy to pray for other people's healing and not ourselves? That's the big question. Or even our own families, right? Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Well, we love you, Carla, and we're praying for you. We give you a big hug. Yeah. I love you guys, and I'm really glad that we had to do this today because I needed to see your faces up close. <laughs> Sam, would you take time to pray for Carla? Sure. And then I, I have a couple things to share, but uh, Lord, I just, God, I know that you know what's going on with Carla. You know uh -huh. uh, her intimately. You know what's going on in her body, and you have the power to heal. And so we ask for that power to come touch Carla's lungs and her airways and her whatever is causing the the lungs to not work the way that should be i just pray that you would eradicate that and get it out mm -hmm. and i pray that you would uh just bring healing not only physically but bring strength mentally and strength for gary too as they go through this and uh god i just pray for your supernatural touch upon both carla and gary and i also cry out for dylan too mm -hmm. as as he meets with the oncologist on Tuesday, I just pray for your strength and wisdom for him and the doctor and for Jen and Doug. And we love you, Lord, and just give this all to you in Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Uh, so Dylan, Dylan made it home uh, last night. The infection is gone that he had in his incision and he uh, meets with the oncologist Tuesday, so I will let you know as soon as I hear from Doug. Uh, I told him to let me know as soon as they find out what they're going to do and how he's doing. So, um, can you give an overview, Tim, of uh, for a few of us that don't know the the Shelby family, just where they are, et cetera? Yeah. So, uh, Doug and Jen uh, Shelby used to go to our church. They've been gone for about ten years. 
they live in uh, they live in College Park, Maryland, just out outside of D.C. And uh, Dylan is going to be turning 17 next month and has been diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And uh, they did surgery, took out a, a cancerous lymph node in his neck that became infected. He was in the hospital just the last couple of days and got home yesterday. And Tuesday, he'll be seeing the oncologist to decide what kind of treatment. And um, I did let Doug and Jen know about immunotherapy, like what Mel uh, Melton went through. So we'll see. And they're optimistic. So hopefully we'll find out some good news soon. Good. Thank you, Tim. So. All right. Any other uh, celebrations? Where have you seen the Lord moving this week or in your life right now? Um, as you're hearing, as we're listening to one another, and as Carla said, one of the reasons that we share celebrations is as we hear from one another, it, it, it edifies and encourages us. And sometimes, more than sometimes, we need that. We need to hear from one another. And so. I'd like to you. share a quick story. Um, I went to meet my friend Robin Meacham for a movie and lunch. And on the way over there, I we were going to the village. On the way over there, I was thinking, hmm, I wonder if something's welling up, up in me, like a message for somebody that I don't even know that maybe the Lord might want me to share. Robin is very well known for going to the village and just asking God uh, for a message and then approaching people, either giving them a note or whatever. So that was in the forefront of my mind. We saw the movie. We had dinner. We really didn't do anything. But on my way home that night, I'm like, I got to get gas in my car. So I pulled into a station I don't normally go into and pull up there, fill in my car. And as I pulled in there, I was like, I felt like a little prompting inside saying, you need to go inside and talk to somebody at the attendant. And I'm like, no, it's dark. It's late. I'm not going to do that. So I filled my cart with gas. And as soon as I was done, the screen on the gas pump said, see attendant for receipt. So I'm like, oh my word, I think I get it, Lord. You really want me to go inside? So I walk inside and I say, okay, Lord, just make it easy. I just pray that there'll be no one behind me in line. So I get inside the gas station and there are two attendants. So I'm okay, Lord, you're going to have to make it available. Whoever's what I'm supposed to talk to. So sure enough, I went up to this guy and I shared the message that I felt like I was supposed to share. Just basically, are you going through a hard time right now? And then to let him know how much the Lord cares and sees him and is there. So I did that and walked out and I just laughed all the way home about how the Lord really helped guide me through that and pointed me to the right person. How many of us have experienced that where we are learning how to hear and, and do what the Lord says, where it's like, uh, is that really you, God? And, and we work through that with faith and and that's you that's I would say the majority of the time there's a there's a resistance that we have. Thank you for sharing that, Melissa. Uh, we all need to push through on those moments. Yeah. Who else? I'll share. Um, if you don't know, Andrew and I are expecting our first child. <laughs> Yeah, um, we're expecting a little girl in May and just the blessing that that has been for us and um, just feeling her kick and moving around and just knowing that God is using my body to grow a human and just grow our family has just been such a huge blessing to us. So I just wanted to share that. Let's pray a blessing over this baby. <laughs> um, let's see, Barb Hemmer, are you, are you here? Can you can you just pray a blessing over Megan's baby? <laughs> sure, sure. Well, Lord, what exciting news to hear mm -hmm. about Megan and yeah. Andrew and the baby coming. And we just celebrate with them, Lord. And we now just pray a blessing over them that all would continue to go well. We continue to pray for health for Megan, for the baby. And Lord, we just uh, celebrate with them and look to all that you have in store for them and for this child that you're bringing into this world. We just pray blessing over them now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I have a quick little story I'll share that 
has to do with this morning and all this beautiful, glorious snow. Um, we went out this morning to attempt to shovel the driveway and all, and in the process are wondering how on earth are we going to do this? I mean, it was really quite overwhelming the amount of snow and realizing that this might take all day. We don't know how we're going to even accomplish this. And about that time, this guy drives by with his um, ATV equipped with a snowplow and he just kept going, but he got to my neighbor's house and all of a sudden he backs up and asks if we wanted help. And I don't even know how to describe to you the emotion I felt in that moment because we truly were wondering how we were going to get this done. And I don't think we could have done it without the help. And God just blessed us with this neighbor that we don't even know who came by with his son and offered help. And it was wonderful. It was wonderful. I'm just thanking the Lord for that. Amen. Thank you, Barb. I could share just a little bit. We got to help our son, Pat, is moving to Coeur d'Alene with his wife. And, uh, you know, I've kind of been worried about him not having a support system up there. And, you know, so I know friends that go to church up there. And he's like, he told me, you know, he's really not interested in going to a Christian church any longer. And uh, yet the Lord just blessed and we got to help him load his pod, <laughs> which was we thought was going to be like almost an impossibility. <laughs> And got all kinds of stuff in there. It was just amazing. And, you know, we had the strength to do that. And then, you know, just to love on them. And let them know that, you know, that doesn't change. I think he's been struggling with telling me what's really going on in his heart for a long time. And I think his wife was like, no, don't talk to her about it because it'll hurt her. And I just told him, you know, I, I want a real relationship with you. And if you, you know, I want to know what's really going on. And, you know, so we have that. And I think he's really seeing the love of Jesus, even though he may not admit that that's what it is. <laughs> and I just, you know, it's neat that God gives you an opportunity, you know, to, to show that. And, you know, we, yeah. We were tired and, you know, amazingly this morning at one o'clock, um, I don't get a lot of sleep anyway. I had this, I noticed that it had stopped snowing and I went out and, and shoveled the three car driveway and the walk and the, <laughs> and the backyard patio. And I had the strength to do that. And it was just a blessing. I knew that was the Lord. I wouldn't have had the strength to do that last year. Wonderful. Thank you, Nancy. All right. Anyone else? Okay, hey, while I'm thinking about being able to do things, I'm just thankful that every month God shows me that I still can go downstairs and teach the children. And some people my age just quit, but that's has kept me going because I don't work at daycare or anything anymore. So I'm just thankful that I'm able to do that because pretty soon I'll be 80 and not everybody can get out and do all that stuff that I can still do. So, because like eight years ago, I had heart failure, but I've been fine ever since. So anyway, so God's always helping me. Amen. Hello? Hello? We can hear you. Good morning. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Oh. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Ann. I don't usually sit up Zoom, but I just wanted to say uh, Monty's had the opportunity to uh, do just what Barb was talking about. Uh, he's out in our neighborhood on his ATV uh, plowing out uh, our friends in the neighborhood. So uh, that's why he's not here. 
but uh, that snowplow, we <laughs> we use it very infrequently, but when we do, our whole neighborhood is glad. So here I am in the warm, and he's got his, I don't know, hunting stuff on, and we have a couple of widows in the neighborhood, actually three, and uh, he's plow actually four. We just lost another neighbor. So he's out plowing. So I guess that's what we call being Jesus to the neighborhood, huh? Amen. Yes, it is. Yeah. Good. So I'm not going to dig him out of the snow. Yeah, as long yeah, as send him my way. <laughs> as long as he doesn't require more help in his helping, then we're in good shape, and that's wonderful. <laughs> Well, good. Well, Saints, it's so good to see all of you. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm just this. It, it's it's a flashback, isn't it? It takes takes us back to, to uh, three and a half, four years ago when we we had to do this because of COVID. And and perhaps we're a little bit uh, nostalgic about that. Now, that wasn't the greatest experience. But at the, on the other hand, we remember that many of us with fondness and so it's just uh it's not very often that we get to worship uh where we're facing each other rather than facing a platform and so um, i'm just i'm rejoicing in that with you all this morning it's good to see your smiling faces as we continue i uh you know i just want to let you know we we were the the pastors yesterday were texting back and forth most of the day yesterday as we were watching the snow and realizing that uh, that may affect us. Uh, Redemption Hill uh, is responsible, was responsible for most of the snow removal and they had planned initially on going ahead and having service and with their worship team and their snow removal, that would have allowed us to do that as well. So we were watching it um, hour by hour and and then about, oh, 1020, 1025 last night, we did get the message from Pastor Robert that Redemption Hill, he was driving around and it was just too much to too much to, to have people come out. So they went ahead and canceled their service, which was uh, our factor to go ahead and uh, to not meet in the building this morning. And so uh, we were watching that right to the long as we could, but uh, we think this is the, the safest and best way. So thank you all for being the church and and for uh, being flexible and adaptable and teachable. F A T fat. Um, that's a that's a good thing to be uh, in this case. So so welcome welcome to our Zoom time together. Uh, by way of nuts and bolts, um, just a couple of reminders uh, on housekeeping here. So as you. Uh, as you know, we are in a time of uh, prayer and fasting right now and want to continue to remind you and encourage you to, to do that. We had a great meeting uh, last Tuesday. There's a, a great slide of that. Um, and uh, we want to encourage you to come on out Tuesday, 630. We're going to do that for the next three Tuesdays. And so we have really made a priority of that. We, we want to do that. If if uh, so, discovery your discovery groups and communities um, come to come to this uh, as an option instead, and we'd love to have you for that. Um, and we we feel like we are already hearing from the Lord. So, but yeah, come on out. Mission updates. Um, a reminder: the Kellers, Matt and Heidi, will be sharing with us. They are the YWAM Boise directors, and they will be sharing with us uh, in two Sundays on uh, January twenty eighth. And then the following Sunday, the first Sunday of February, February 4th, uh, the Kindleburgers will be uh, will be sharing with us as they're returning. Uh, and so we're, we're excited to hear from them as well. Um, this morning, we really have a privilege of hearing from uh, Don and Cindy and Marvin and Brenda as they have returned and um, I think re-entered. We'll find out shortly here from them. Uh, we'll find out. Uh, we're just uh, anxious to hear a report on how their trip to uh, China and Southeast Asia went. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Don and Cindy and Brenda and Marvin. Share with us. Um, 
Um, I think we're going to go ahead. We'll go ahead and start. If you want to put up the first slide, and we're going to have Marvin and Brenda share to start with. So, thank you so much. So uh, um, let's can you back up a slide? I think there's one in front of that one. Uh. Uh, it's in a different order. We'll get to it. There. Uh, no, about okay. that. It's the marriage seminar one, I think. Yeah, do start with the marriage seminar one. It's previewing differently here. Just a second, please. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so we were privileged to be able to do uh, a pastor's one day seminar. And um, the the people that you're looking at right here, uh, they are the first responders uh, in Infall right now. Um, we are good friends. Uh, we, we've become good friends with a pastor there. Um, his house was burned. His church was burned. Every, they lost everything. Their cars were burned. Um, they had to leave. They fled. Um, and and this is where the first responder uh, comes in, is that they rented a car and they went back. And they, they didn't um, abandon their people. Um, they're doing what they have to do to continue um, to disciple, um, to rally around their their congregations. Um, not only will everything personal that they had is gone, their church headquarters is gone, uh, uh, and their just everything is gone, and yet they. They came out to this uh, seminar, um, which was not easy for many of them. They uh, they had open hearts and open minds, and um, uh, the big and I, this Don Don brought this up to me, and I I didn't really understand this till we went. But just the fact of seeing a husband and wife teach together is uh, a life changing thing. Now that we did bring uh, things that the Lord uh, wanted us to say, but. Um, <clears throat> We so we are praying that just that fact that they saw uh, a husband and wife teaching together will uh, expand things, um, make I don't make things move faster, I guess. But anyway, uh, these these are the first responders. Uh, they stayed or they came back. And uh, it, it was just such an honor to be able to get to know some of these people, to pray for some of these people. Um, and it, it was an encouragement to me um, and and just coming back, uh, it, it it built up it built up my faith to see them and, to, to say, you know, God, you are the same everywhere. It doesn't matter. And uh, again, it was just a privilege. They came there. Um, there's a there's a curfew. So they came, some of them quite a long distance, and then they had to get back home um, at a certain time. Um, and yet they they took the time um uh, and and the um I can't quite think of the right word the effort the effort 
to come out and and to learn. And uh, what about what a beautiful bunch of people. Just we we were blessed. Eve, you want to go to this next slide? Or Tammy? <laughs> Not that one. The uh, um, the one with the two pastors and Elia. Not that one. So there's one left. <laughs> there that one that one so you know i would characterize this trip as a trip of prayer and hope and it was so good to have a powerful prayer team that was supporting us and it was obvious as we went from place to place that the ground was being prepared as we went and also a trip of hope um you know just just us coming at this time when there was a lot of turmoil in the land. Um, it gave hope to the people that we came to visit and those that we met for the first time. But um, it was also a hope for us because getting the opportunity to see um, just what God's doing and his faithfulness to his people, um, it was an encouragement of hope to us as well. And so in specific, the gentleman in the back of this picture is Elia's um, father. This is Indonesia. Um, he is uh, a pastor in Wamana um, and Elia works with MAF and he is uh, doing missions work throughout Indonesia. And the person that he has his arm around is the pastor of the church that we were visiting there. And the, the interesting story about this place is that we were going with Elia and his father to go and uh, a place that overlooked Wamana Valley and to see and pray for Wamana. But there was a storm coming in, so we didn't go there. We went to visit this, this church, which was the first church that his father had started. Um, and you know, we got there, we got to see a celebration of a pig roast. We got to see uh, multiple tribes joining together for this celebration, which is a big deal in a place where tribes don't join together. Um, and, you know, we got to pray for the pastor and we got to um, pray over the church, which they're um, uh, renovating. Um, and, and it was really a, a, a wonderful time. Um, as we had finished praying for the pastor, who, which, by the way, he needs a motorcycle because he's become uh, a, 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 a spokesman in the area and needs to be able to travel. But anyway, afterwards, he said, well, the night before last, um, God showed me that these <clears throat> white people were going to, excuse me. We're going to come and pray for us and for our church. And, you know, what a confirmation that God was preparing the path. A little later on, we also uh, were told that, oh, by the way, white people weren't supposed to be going into that area because it was restricted. And so what a testimony of God's faithfulness and his um, providing hope uh, for uh, his people. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. You can go ahead and advance to the next slide then, um, Tammy. That'd be great. There you go. You're up. Oh, no. You're up. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll wait. Well, then. That's okay. I'll, never mind. I'm just going to jump in. We'll do the other slide later. Um, so this was um, a set of pictures that I took when we were in Mae Sai, Thailand, which is the very northernmost city in Thailand. And it borders up against Myanmar. So the Burmese students who normally, we would normally go into Burma, into Myanmar and meet with them, um, wanted to come out and meet together. And as we were preparing to come, we found out that it was really quite dangerous because 
they were res restricted movement. So while foreigners are not allowed to go into Myanmar, they said, we'll come across and meet you in Thailand. But then we realized that it was at great peril and, and some significant risk to most of them. So what we had said, let's not, let's not meet face to face. Let's just, we'll come to Thailand. We'll, we'll, uh, you know, just FaceTime, we'll just video with you there. And um, you don't need to come across the border. Don't take that risk just because we're coming. Um, but they were so hungry for fellowship. And they, and they and one by one, they said, no, no, we want to come. We want to come. And so as they came across, um, you'll see that picture with all the shoes there and the students uh, in, that, in the back of the students. We're not, we we promised them that we wouldn't show their faces. So that's why um, it's kind of maybe an odd set of pictures in that way. But I was trying to figure out a way to, to, to show a feel for what we were, where we were without exposing their faces because for some of them, um, they worked in the government, they worked in many different sectors and it put them at risk by coming out and being in a Christian organization. But, as we were ministering to the um, one group after another, every single country we went to, we ministered to, to groups of people who were in peril, um, whether it was the civil war and the tribal war in India and um, with the um, government takeover, the, the military coup that's going on in Burma and so many um, even still displaced and, and uh, burning down still churches and so forth. So um, what we saw people in peril over and over again, every place that we went. And uh, as we began to minister to them, you know, there's a, I never felt like we were the ones that should be um, concerned. What was the concern was could is there a way to strengthen those? And, you know, when you minister to people who are in great peril, they don't want your sympathy. They don't want, you know, we're not there to show them our empathy that, gosh, we really recognize how, you know, the great sacrifices. That's not going to minister life. What they really wanted was the assurance of the word of God. And so God just gave us word after word to be able to minister to them that, just like Elisha, as he prayed and said, Lord, open the eyes of my servant that he could see. And he opened his eyes and saw the chariots on the hills. And so we began to pray for them. Open their eyes, Lord, that they could see your provision and your protection over them as they go about the ministry that you've called them to. And uh, and just word after word, you know, the, it says in Psalm 20, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord, our God. And, and we could begin to minister to them over and over again, not our sorrow, not our sadness for what they're going through. And we realized that for these, for these particular Burmese students, they were going home to even a more dangerous time. They knew. And even now uh, we talked to somebody last night or this morning and, uh, the violence is increasing, although their, their sense of being delivered is also increasing, but the danger is, is very uh, prevalent and increasing there. But knowing that we're sending them back to an even more dangerous situation, we could say, you know, pray th that the eyes of their understanding would be open, that the Lord would hear them that hear the cry of their heart, hear them in the days of trouble and deliver them. And the God of Jacob would lift them up and deliver them. And so we were able to minister, despite the fact that we come from every kind of convenience. I mean, um, you know, a little bit of snow, what's that, yeah. right? <laughs> Today we woke up and like, whoa, we've got all these driveways to do. But, you know, um, God's word is so powerful. And 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 we saw that uh in, in every single area that we went to, that God strengthened his people, that God is faithful to his word. And, you know, as the Bible says that um, Jesus said, I'm going away, but I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And he's going to be bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. And so as we give the word of God out throughout this trip, we came away really with that assurance that the word of God, God is going to continue on to encourage those that we saw, even though we can't be there 
um, all the time to do it. So it was a very powerful trip and it was very encouraging, even though uh, we were working with um, so many displaced people and people in, in dire needs and suffering. That's right. That's right. So. Yeah. And then the last slide. Should get to the last slide. One left. Yeah, we have a tech issue there. No, go back up. <laughs> what we see previewed and what you guys see is that's not the same. So. It's all right. That's all right. Well, the other, the 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 young uh, the, the young man that you saw earlier, Elia, is from Indonesia. And we met Elia and his wife, Brianna, when they were here training at MAF in Nampa. And uh, Elia is from Indonesia grew up on the mission field uh, and grew up with Mission Aviation Fellowship serving his parents uh, who were uh, missionaries in, in Wamana. You met his father there in that picture. He was a, a church planner and, uh, and, uh, and Brianna is from Canada. So we met them when they were here and, and uh, they're, li they're little kids. And, uh, and now uh, they've asked Elia MAF has asked Elia to be a development director because he is has been to Bible school. He is a pilot himself, and uh, and even it's strategically important that Brianna uh, is also fluent in Indonesian, mm -hmm. and as a Westerner coming from Canada, has a real voice yeah. for uh, you know for development, for what they're tasked to do to, to um, raise awareness, raise funds for MAF. So you see the picture there with their three children and just we just spent a delightful time with them. And the snowballs. Yeah, we brought snowballs, uh, you know, in a, in a game. <laughs> and they, they, were, they were missing that in their, from their time in Canada. And, but the, but the heart of this whole trip was we, we left uh, knowing that we would connect with 11 distinct groups uh, when we left with Marvin and Brenda, and we ended up making connections with almost 20 on this trip. And, and, and it's just the relationships that God has blessed us with over, you know, some are new, some have gone for many decades. And it is amazing what happens when you go. It's almost, it's almost like, uh, the Hemmers were just sharing about their neighbor who came over. What a blessing. Because he came. He was there. You know, and and it's just something when you go. And the conversations that we had uh, were more important than we can even imagine. And the fact that, you know, it's an arduous trip. We We were actually 16 time zones away from Boise. So we're over halfway around the world. <laughs> and, and uh, and I, I was thinking that this morning as I was shoveling because it, uh, the weather app was saying it was 91 degrees in Jakarta, but it feels like 100, you know, because because <laughs> the humidity was uh, as it is and uh, and uh, missing that a little bit today. It'd be kind of fun to, you know, bottle that a little bit. But the relationships are, are the important thing. And we were in places, as Cindy said, that were quite troubled in some places, and uh, we're giving you kind of a snippet of, of maybe four of these uh, 20 that we, that we visited, but Christianity typically was like 4% of, of one group where Muslim, Hindu, Buddha, Buddhism made up the 90 plus percent of the, of the religions in that area. And, you know, you really see, uh, where got where the gospel's being planted yes. and uh more than once we kind of were talking among ourselves that this is must have been how it felt a little bit in the first century as you're introducing for for the first time the 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 christian message the the hope of the gospel in an area that has lived for decades and centuries without without that hope mm -hmm. so so there's a little snapshot of what we were doing and uh, we just had a delightful time. Every day was uh, early morning to late at night. And uh, God was blessing us 
so much. And yeah. as Marvin shared, the prayer support yes, was so important. Yes. We really felt uh, the necessity of that. We knew it going in. We knew it way more as we were going through it. And, and as we look back, we see God's hand was really upon us and upon all of you who prayed with us. And so we thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andersons and Nelsons. Uh, you know, church, a couple of things grabbed my attention as I just listened to this report. Um, you know, Cindy said that uh, they visited uh, a portion of the, the church in Thailand and Burma and in Indonesia that was in, what was the word she used, peril. And uh, and then I I hear, what grabbed my attention is I hear Don so rightly saying that um, our words and the word of life, um, our words are, are more important than we can imagine. And that is so true whether we are uh, speaking with people that are uh, the, the, the church that is in peril uh, and is a super minority in their people groups, whether it's with one another across the snow, across the sidewalk, our words, we have the words of life and death in our tongue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Our words are more important than we can imagine. Oh, and so, uh, you know, as we begin to just transition to, I know Steve's got an important message that he wants to share with us and, and continuing in the series about the Jesus-shaped adventure. Um, uh, I encourage us all to reflect on on that, that we can bless. Uh, and those. it's not just simply saying blessings. Uh, it's almost trivial or trite, but our words are, are life and death. Our words are powerful. And so thank you, Andersons. Thank you, Nelsons, for your faithfulness on the trip. Uh, 20 distinct groups. We know that the words that you share, the words that you heard have power. And we bless what the Holy Spirit has done and will do with those words in Jesus' name. We thank you for your faithfulness. And we are encouraged, each of us, in our calling uh, in our places of responsibility to be faithful and to use our words that are, we can't imagine how important they are. Amen? Amen. Right. So, uh, Steve, uh, we bless you as you um, just share what's on your heart and what you prepared uh, in Jesus' name. And we open our ears and hearts to hear what you would say, Lord, to us uh, through these words now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Andersons and Nelsons. And I think for me, what's exciting is the fact that you uh, were an extension of our body, that when you guys were there, you were reaching out with the hands of Jesus to bless people that most of us can't touch um, or see, or even like comprehend that they even exist, you know, it's so sad, right? We live in such, um, an insular world where it's like, we don't even know who exists out there who's worshiping Jesus. So thank you for bringing us their stories and their faces. And I hope that for all of us, it connects us more deeply with the church worldwide and what God is doing, um, in places that are both perilous and not perilous, you know, to be in ministry. So thank, thank you for that. Um, I want to apologize for the technical difficulties we had. We're using um, some, some uh, anyway, we just had some issues in terms of being able to see what you guys were seeing. And so, hence uh, the back and forth. And I apologize for the distraction that that was. Um, I would say how many were here last week, but uh, I can't see everyone's uh, uh, at the same time as doing what I'm doing. So uh, I hope that uh, for those who were last week, you recall that we're really beginning to lean into um, what it means, uh, beginning to talk about what it means to uh, live out a Jesus-shaped adventure. If we're called to pursue wanderers, to help them become 
adventures with Jesus? What does this call to a Jesus-shaped adventure look like? And so we want to talk about that, and we're going to talk about that for um, multiple months. And so um, I also invited you all last last week uh, to uh, join us uh, during the week in the, the Bible Project Sermon on the Mount read-along. Uh, it's a great, great resource, and, and I learned you know, some things, I'll share that a little bit later this week. It's like, huh, I never saw that verse that way. So this is good. We're getting uh, new things. So check out the Bible Project. And uh, so we talked about how uh, spiritual formation in his likeness. You, you see the statue of David there and not knowing if we he would be on a big screen or not. And you could see details. I went ahead and put some swim trunks over him. But um uh, in, in, in real life, it's in his full glory. And all that's all I'll say about that. Other than to say that when you see a nine foot tall statue from 50 feet away, uh, you can see just uh, how exquisitely, uh, this statue is formed and the, the statue that's in front of it in the foreground is, um, is the beginning of a sculpture that Michelangelo had, hadn't finished by the time he, died. And I think about the fact that we are all in process, that we are all um, being shapen out of something that is just dust. <laughs> and that is just uh, that, that Jesus is shaping us. And when we talk about this adventure with Jesus, we're really talking about spiritual formation into his likeness. And Rowan says, those who are called according to his purpose, those who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And so um, all of the experiences that we have in the world are, are part of forming us. And they can form us uh, in, in the shape of Jesus, in the likeness of Jesus. And if we're not submitted to that process, they can misshape us. And we all know people that, um, you know, you, you look at their lives and you go, oh, wow, wow. Um, it's some, it needs more formation, right? And, and we all, when we see him, we'll be like him. And we know that we won't, won't complete that process until we see him, but it is a process. And so I just want to start by saying that when we think about this, um, this concept of spiritual formation, we should, we should say that everybody gets spiritually formed. Everybody in the world, Christian or non-Christian, Buddhist, agnostic, atheist, you know, whatever, Everybody gets spiritually formed, and the reason for that is because we are all made in the image of God, right? And if God is spirit, and that what part of the image of God that we are is spiritual beings, then no matter what, everybody who is created, everybody who is born, is formed spiritually. And the gravity of the world that we live in will shape us. And... Um, Sorry, something just clicked in the middle of my screen. The gravity of the world that we live in will shape us. And whether we like it or not, we're shaped when we wake up and we listen to the radio or read the newspaper or interact with our neighbors or whatever it is, we will be shaped. And um, we have to think about the fact that if we are being shaped, whether we are submitting to a process of being shaped intentionally or whether we're being shaped by the spirit of the air, as it were, in our lives, we will be shaped. And so uh, it, it reminds me of a story that uh, about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Some of you know, it was a German pastor and theologian, and he um, lived in pre-World War II uh, Germany, and then through the war was executed as, uh, as part of a plot to assassinate Hitler. Uh, he, his family was a you know, um, you know, well, not maybe not well to do, but was a, a family of repute in Germany. And prior to the war, he went out into the countryside and started a Christian commune and drew his disciples and his a congregation there that was something called the anti-Nazi confessional church. And uh, basically, they were trying to live out in a very hostile environment to the true church, um, what it meant to be Jesus followers. And his brother came out to him in the wilderness and uh said bro 
Like you're embarrassing the family. What are you doing? You need to come back. You need to get back in. You need to stop this. And so Dietrich uh, rode him across the lake, took him to a hillside above a Nazi training camp. And he pointed down to it and he said, until this, what God is doing to us is greater than what's going on here. We can't stop. And, and what that points out to me is that you will be formed one way or another, and that there are forces in, in the spirit that want to shape you not like Jesus. And that unless we submit ourselves to a process and involve ourselves in the process of being shaped into Jesus likeness, we will be shaped like something else. And so we need to really think as the body of Christ not to think that people by sitting in the church will automatically be shaped by Jesus over the course of their life into his likeness without some intentionality behind that. Yes, they'll be shaped somewhat, but we need to give more intentionality to that shaping and we need to participate with that. And so uh, we talked about how part of the, the themes in the scripture point to this big story that's throughout the scripture in many different lives of wilderness, uh, the journey in the wilderness, and that there's these themes that are, that are common and that uh, take place in a lot of different uh, lives that are in scripture. And we see that in our own lives. We see that, um, that this journey into the wilderness, into isolation or exile or whatever it is, that it often starts with a call or an inclination to do something wild or do something beyond, you know, our ability. Um, and it plunges us into great difficulty, right? Uh, for those who've been on the mission field. Uh, for those who have ever done something in faith, you know, and it could be as something as simple as talking to your neighbor about Jesus, or it could be starting a, a new venture in the Lord or just in business, or it could be marriage or it could be any number of things, right? And we go into the season where we don't have the skills, we don't have the knowledge, we don't have the ability that we, that we have, we don't have the spiritual wisdom or the spiritual maturity. And so then God uses the difficulty to begin to shape us. And so that sense of call is really important, but before we talk about calling, it's really important we talk about identity. And I want you all, if you have your wallets or your purses or something like that nearby, uh, you know, see if you can grab it. It'd be more fun if we were, you know, pulling out our IDs and maybe trading them with each other and you could go, wow, you look young. How old is that picture or something like that? Um, uh, you go, yeah. You look pretty good in that picture. None of us like our just driver's license photo, though, do we? And none of us, especially like the passport photo where you can't smile and show any teeth. But like our IDs are really important. Or as uh, as Helen Pars in The Incredibles, your identity is your most valuable possession. Protect it. I think about when we were on our trip recently and like I had my passport in this sleeve and it was under my shirt and I was protecting it. And we were on this really crowded uh, subway going into, into Athens and we were told, you know, watch pickpocketers. They're really wily. And this guy was really close to me and he had like a, he had a coat or a newspaper, something like that. And suddenly I actually felt like something ruffle underneath my shirt. And he like, he was standing real close to me. And I don't know if it was him trying something or if we were just close to each other, but I pushed back and I pushed up his hand and his, his jacket or newspaper, whatever it was. And he looked at me really crossly and started yelling at me in Greek. And I'm like, dude, get away. You know, and I thought he was trying to take my passport or my, my money. And it was, I wanted to protect it. And then he got off and I thought, maybe he thought I was trying to steal from him. I don't know, <laughs> but um, you got to protect your identity, right? And so this whole question of who are you? And when we talk about identity in Christ, we're not talking about, you know, Stephen Chad Reams or in May 10th, 1971, Social Security 5365219960, not my real Social Security number or birthday, just FYI. But we're not talking about those identities. We're talking in the kingdom of God about the identity of the person that God is shaping forever. And when we entered into a relationship with Jesus, he began the process of shaping us more like his son, and as kingdoms, as citizens of the kingdom of God, that's a process that he's doing. When we see him, we'll be like him. But they're the, they're the people that we are becoming for the rest of eternity. And isn't that amazing that God's going to shape, take our uniqueness and our personality. And somehow in eternity, he's going to use that. But we're going to be made perfect and complete 
like Jesus at that time. And Dallas Willard has a thought about this. He says, his plan is to develop as apprentices to Jesus to the point where we can take our place in the ongoing creativity of the universe. And I'm not going to take time to explain all of the theology that goes behind that statement. You can read Willard's book if you want to. Um, but, but there's this aspect when we were formed, and we'll talk about this in the coming weeks, when we were formed as human beings, that God invited us into partnership with them. And so we have to believe that that partnership and all the scriptures that talk about co-reigning with Christ, that, that in the future, in eternity, that part of that will be the ongoing creativity in the universe. And we can have different views about that. And I'm not going to talk a lot about that, but uh, read Dallas Willard and see if he convinces you. And so when I think about what we are becoming or what we are patterning ourselves after, Whenever we use ourself as the referent, we're going to get in trouble. How many of you have heard this, this phrase? I just want to become the best version of myself as possible, right? I hear this all the time. I hear this in talks. I hear people say this. Uh, I hear both Christians and non-Christians say this. And, and, I, and I think it's important to, to think about the fact whenever we use ourself as the referent, as the model, we're going to have trouble if there's going to be a problem because myself as a 2.0 or a 3.0 version or a 16.0 version, a better version of myself, it's still a version of myself. And here's what the scriptures say very clearly. He's not making us according to our image. He's making us according to Jesus image. So let's look at the scriptures a little bit and talk about and see where, where we, we see that. So in Colossians, Paul writes, do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on <clears throat> the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according in the image of its creator. So we're not being renewed 2.0, 5.0, whatever point oh version of ourself. We're being renewed in the image of our creator in knowledge. And in him, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and is in all. Galatians. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized in Christ have clothed yourself with Christ, not a better version of yourself. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. It's important. Some of your versions might say sons or daughters of God. And that's okay because in, in our current context, we know that sons and daughters can inherit uh, things in our, in our time. But certainly in the time that Paul was writing, daughters couldn't be heirs. And so that whole scripture is about you are sons. All of you are sons. It's not about male nor female. All of you are sons because all of you are heirs with Christ according to the promise. So don't, don't, don't stumble on that language if it says just son. But that's what that means. It means all of us are inheritors. And then in Philippians, Paul says, our citizenship is in heaven. We also eagerly await a Savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ will transform these humble bodies of ours into the likeness of his glorious body by means of that power by which he's able to subject all things to himself. So I, I think these scriptures, they, 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 they like these and others, certainly they obliterate this idea of becoming the best version of yourself. We all need to be covered up and clothed in Christ. All right. And, and so the scripture I was thinking about when, when I was listening to the Sermon on the Mount series this week um, in uh, with the Bible project is said at the end of all that you've heard it say, but I say to you, you've heard it say, and then at the end, he says, be whole as I am whole. And growing up, I was always taught that was be holy as I am holy or be perfect as I am perfect. And that word isn't holy. And when it says perfect, it means be complete. So when when Jesus is saying, be whole, be complete, be perfect, he's saying, I want my wholeness to be your wholeness. And he's inviting us into his wholeness. 
And that's, that's what that Sermon on the Mount that that means. And that was kind of a new thought for me. And, and I think all these scriptures all say whenever we use primarily an identity that's based in the earth, whether it's race or gender or national identity or political party or occupation or age or height or looks or whatever, we're not living according to the image of Christ. And if we confuse those two, that can, that can lead us into trouble. And Tamara told, I said I could tell her this story. We were just talking about this yesterday. And I said, can I use that? And uh, some of you know that Tamara was adopted from someone uh, when she grew up in Western Washington, adopted at birth. And she grew up knowing that she was born in, in Seattle. And um, later when she met her birth mother as an adult, uh, as the subject of um, nationality came up and, and, Tamara said, well, I'm Swedish, right? And her birth mother says, no, Our, my family's not Swedish. No, no, I'm Swedish. She's like, where, where did you get the idea that we're sweet? you were Swedish? She says, well, I knew that I was born at Swedish Hospital in Seattle. Yes. So those of you who live in Western Washington know there's a hospital named Swedish Hospital, but not all people born there are Swedes. So... <laughs> So, so out of this data point, Swedish hospital, she had constructed all of her growing up years, this thing in her mind about her identity, that she was Swedish. Now she's blonde and she's tall. And for me, she's Swedish. All right. <laughs> all right. Good luck. But, but to take on an identity off of a few data points. And so sometimes we have constructed in our own minds, in our own hearts, our own spirits, who we think we are based on, you know, small data points. And, and even some of those things we may have heard growing up that our parents or teachers or friends or whoever said to us, they have infiltrated our hearts and they've influenced the way that we think about our identity, don't they? And just a few data points can send us on a trajectory that I can't do that. I can only do this. I'm not smart, I'm not capable, I can't speak, I'm not able to be a minister of Jesus Christ, how I'm disqualified. Like we can construct these identities and these thoughts that are not based on how God thinks about us. And so when we think about identity, we have to fixate our identity on our heavenly identity. And identity and calling are, to some degree, interlaced with each other, aren't they? They seem like they are. Like, we have to know, though, that one is really dependent on the other. And to some degree, your calling on earth, your calling may, in fact, be flavored by your earthly identity. Like, most of us aren't called to 12th century uh, English people minister to them right i mean the time that we live in the nationality that we are our, our gender our education our socioeconomic status those do flavor our calling they don't necessarily restrict it entirely but they do flavor our calling and who we might be called to but we need to be sure that our identity and i never gave i never gave a, a, a good definition of this but but maybe this you can try this on, and certainly if you have a better definition, then throw it in the chat. Our identity is what you believe about yourself to be most true. And when we think biblically what our identity is, we need to think that it's what God believes about us to be most true. Okay? And so our identity depends on our calling, not our calling, excuse me, our identity depends not on our calling and on our performance. Our calling depends on our identity. Okay. So identity first in Christ, and then that flows into our calling. And see, here, here's the thing. And let's talk about some of the scriptures that, that shape this. So I'm going to read from Luke. We see in Jesus' life that at his baptism, we see that the Father in impressed upon him in no uncertain terms right it says that when all the people were baptized it came to pass this is luke 3 21 when all the people were baptized it came to pass that jesus was also baptized and while he prayed the heaven was opened 
And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, you are my beloved son and you I'm well pleased. And so God in vocal out in the air, the voice came and says, you are my beloved son. He's speaking to him his identity. All right. And this impresses on Jesus. You are my son. But then we see, if you flip over to chapter four, verse one, then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. Those days he ate nothing afterwards, and when they had ended, he was hungry, and the devil came to him and started tempting him. And so we see that Jesus was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness. So out of his identity, he obeyed God. And then we go down, when the devil had ended every temptation, verse 13, he departed from him until an opportune time. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and the news of him went out throughout the surrounding region, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And so he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. He was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And we opened the book. He found the place where it was written. And here he is announcing his calling. He has his identity secure. He obeyed God. And then he says, this is my calling. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, Recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the, of the Lord. And when he had finished it, he closed the book, sat down and said, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And so you see clearly the identity, you are my beloved son, causes Jesus to live out of the identity and obedience. And he follows through in the temptations and obeys God only and responds only to his voice and to his words. And then out of that proceeds his calling. And so our calling flows from our identity. Now, when you look at the rest of these scriptures, and we're not going to read them all, but this would be great meditation, we see the same pattern in all of these scriptures. We see Ephesians 1 and 2. It's all about who we are in Christ and what he's done, and we're seated with him in the, in the heavenlies and all these beautiful pronouncements. And then chapter 3 and 4 Therefore, because of all this, I entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. And then he goes into a list of all the things to obey that in. All right. And in Galatians, you see all of the things about how we're spiritual heirs. And it's not from works and it's out of faith. And then only after that, Galatians 5. Now you are called to freedom. Therefore, don't be enslaved to those things. Again, the things that do, do, the, do the works of the law or the works of the flesh. And it's a list of all the things you shouldn't do and do. Col Colossians 3. And again, Colossians 1 and 2, it's talking about all these things, about who we are, about our identity in Christ. And then 3, one, since you've been raised with Christ, seek things above. You've been died and your life is in in Christ. And then he goes on and gives the application. And it's the same in Philippians. And so we, we see that there, the clear pattern is that our calling, our walk through, our, our obedience, our what we do and don't do flows best from knowing who we are in Christ. And I'd just like to kind of come to a close here and say that part of the sickness of our world with regards to its identity and all the confusion people have about their identities. And this is true also of those inside and outside of Christ. Is that whenever the focus of our identity is based on who we are in the world, how we perform, what we think we are in the natural, things just get messed up and misshapen. And... When we focus on the identity that God declares, he shapes us towards that identity. Therefore, keep your eyes on the things in heaven. Keep your eyes on Christ. Now, on Friday, as I was preparing, I had the very, very distinct impression that I wasn't supposed to write the end of the sermon. And it's like, well, what does that mean, Lord? And 
I just had a real sense that based out of what I shared that some of you might be willing to share the practical application for this. And so I'd like to open this up with this question. And if you want to um, raise your hand and Rock can call on you, uh, what are some practical ways that we can lean into the identity the Father speaks about us? And if you have a sense in your own life of how you've practiced leaning into your heavenly citizenship, your heavenly identity, the identity that God sees you as. And there you have a real practical thing to share with us. I feel like that's how we're supposed to finish up today and learn from one another and not just me talking at a camera, but I know there's a lot of lovely faces behind that camera. So uh, with that, I'm just gonna leave that question up there. No, there's the question. What are the practical ways we can lean into the identity the Father speaks about us? I'm gonna stop that so we can all see each other and if you have something you want to share rock i'll let you kind of facilitate this and i want to learn from you all too so i can't see uh, on my screen every attender what about 80%? So I got to switch back and forth between screens. So you're welcome to verbally raise your hand as well. So I, can really... I got something wrong. Okay. It's Kevin. Go ahead, Kevin. Um, so um, something that uh, um, that we do in, uh, or that we, that we learn to do um, uh, from Ted Roberts in, uh, um, and seven pillars is to, you know, basically, um, to, uh, start each day with like a, um, with prophetic promises, what God has said to you, um, what God says about you, you just listening for what, um, what he's said to you, what his promises are, what he, you know, what the scripture says, um, is, uh, good about you and you know just when you wake up in the morning being being an intent, intentional about um, thinking about those things right I mean right when I open my eyes start thinking about those things um, and thanking God uh, being grateful for uh, what he's given me and and uh, um, anyway that's, that's how I like to start my day um, and that's uh, that's where it starts I have something as well, Rock. Um, it's very similar, actually. Um, through different uh, things that I've gone through, I've I've listened to the Lord about my identity and what He says about me, um, and then trying to like retrain my heart to believe what my head knows um, has been, you know, linking what God says about me with scripture. Um, and, and, uh, and then in, in the effort to really learn that in my heart and, um, get it out of just being a head knowledge thing. Um, one of the things I've kind of fallen into putting into practice, I don't even remember how I started this, but, um, I wear, two rings on my fingers and I wear a, ro a watch and sometimes earrings. Um, and I've kind of gotten into the habit um, in the morning when I put on my jewelry, each piece of jewelry has uh, a, part of my, a part of my identity linked to it. Um, so as I put on each piece, I remind myself of those things that God says about me and the scripture that goes with that. Um, and then as I take those things off at night, I say them again in my head and I just remind myself of who God says I am um, and what God's word says about who I am. And that has really helped it to, to, to change from being head knowledge to heart knowledge. Um, and uh, yeah, the Lord's walked me through a process in that and, you know, undoing, like Steve said, some of those things that are spoken over you, um, especially when you're young that uh, have a way of getting into your identity that are false, you know, and, and just being able to overwrite that with what God says about who I am. Uh, 
I don't know if my my hand came through or not, Rock. I see you. I hear you. Go for it. Okay. Is it okay? All right. So I, I literally have an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper uh, that is uh, full of who God says I am. Um, and I, I period, well, for a time I went over it every day till I inter internalized those things. And now I go back to it every once in a while, but, um, that, that was, uh, really effective for me. And, and the other thing I do is when I start being negative to myself, myself to myself, or if there's, um, uh, negative things coming about me from the outside, I just stop and I go, Lord, is that true? I just literally, I just ask him, Lord, is that true? I don't, I don't want to be <clears throat> ignorant to the fact that, you know, sometimes I need to change. Um, but on the other hand, I'm not going to take anything in that isn't truth. And and the and the way I figure that out is I just ask, and if he says no, I'm like I reject it. If he says well, you know, and he's always kind, right? He's always kind, you know. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You might want to look at that, you know. Um, and and that's that has really kept me from falling into. Um, that downward spiral of just like there's nothing good about me, right? <laughs> um, so that's that's my two things. Beautiful. Here are some just really great practical ways that we can begin to shape our identity in, in agreement with the Lord. Who else? What has worked for you? Yeah, go ahead, Ray. Um, one of the things that I've learned to do when there is, when I've been able to identify a lie, like Brenda was talking about when something has come up and I've asked, is that true? Um, and God says, no, that's not true about you. Um, I spend some time in reflection with him, like, where'd that come from then? Is this something from a long time ago that I heard as a child um, that's been reinforced over the years? And then um, when I identify the source, then I just kind of imagine, visualize putting that thing in a box and giving the box back to that person that that wasn't mine to carry and not that's not about me. That's really about the person that it came from. Um, and usually that's from another person. And there's often a long, long line of people standing behind that that box can be passed back to. And doing that helps me get it out of my system, but also helps me with my relationships with people who are still in my life who maybe originated some of those lies and being able to be compassionate toward myself, but also compassionate toward them that they've been carrying stuff that doesn't really belong to them either. And um, and then I always ask to for a replacement for that. Like I got rid of this, I sent it in the box down the line, but I also need to know what is true then and um, and work on receiving that as a gift from the Lord. Beautiful. Thank you, Ray. Hello. Yeah, I just want to um, reiterate what Ray said. I, when I first became a Christian, well, really a long time in my Christian walk, I had... I would feel sorry for myself. Um, no matter what happened, I would feel sorry for myself. So I did what Ray was talking about. And I just asked the Lord, where does that come from? Because my parents were always very affirming and, 
you all have been affirming to me, uh, morning has in my family. And I, I actually had a picture that the Lord took me back to when I was an infant. Um, my mother was divorced, I think you know, and she, um, uh, when my biological father abandoned us, she went back to live in this small town in Texas. And I distinctly had a picture of people looking at me and some of them even holding me and saying, poor little thing, poor little thing, uh, because of what had happened to mother and me. And so the power of the Holy Spirit in breaking those, I think, are central to really internalizing who I am in Christ, those very things that we all have a list. Some just showed me his. And uh, but don't forget that the Holy Spirit can direct us to those things if we're stuck and confused and then lop it off with his mighty right arm and plead the blood uh, over that because he's given us the power to um, I think you read that scripture. Uh, Steve, about forgetting what lies behind and pressing on. And after that, I it's amazing what the Lord has done. But um, I think we need to expect him to show up in visions, uh, in words of knowledge, in discernment, in uh, all the things that everybody I see on this screen know about. And to not uh, dwell on uh, who we've been, but who we're becoming. So that's it. Thank you, Ann. Caleb or Tim Strauss, I think you. Yeah. To say yep. Yeah. I, one of the things that has been really helpful for me is uh, e even just in the last uh, couple of weeks, I've started. Uh, in the mornings doing declarative prayer and specifically walking through putting on uh like the full armor of god and and going through okay what does it look like to put on the tr the belt of truth the shoes of the gospel of peace the breastplate of righteousness take up the shield of faith the sword of the spirit and the helmet of salvation and uh just pr praying through and, and speaking each of those things and in that way kind of uh, putting on that identity in Christ and all of these things are things that are are given to me by him, not something that I am on my own. And that's been that's been really helpful to like practically do that each morning. Thank you, Caleb. Could I share one more thing, Rock? Of course. This is Steve. Um, another thing that really helped me um, before I started the uh, a ritual, if you will, with my jewelry, um, that really helped me was uh, going through a process like like Anne and Ray both kind of talked about of, of uh, identifying those points, you know, where um, where things set into our minds, you know, those those moments, and asking the Lord to identify that um, was going then through a process of asking Jesus, where were you in this, in this moment, you know, that was painful. Um, and, uh, set these negative things in my mind, you know, where were you? And God showed me some really beautiful things. Um, you know, and in each circumstance where I had a moment where my heart as a young child took on a lie, you know, God showed me, you know, I was right there with you, you know, and, and gave me a, a picture in my mind. Um, and I walked through this with some other people too, and God showed people differently. Um, but he always showed up when that question was asked and, um, and it helped to kind of like Ray said, um, when she said, after she gave that away, she asked for a replacement. And for me, that's, that was that replacement of Jesus showing me, um, 
his truth. You know, sometimes he would show me um, if he was the other person in the scenario um, instead of that person, how he would have responded. Um, or sometimes he just showed me that he was there holding my hand the whole time. Um, and it helped me to have a, an emotional experience that replaced the emotional wound that happened in the first place because we are healed um, in relationship and with emotion, just like we are wounded in relationship and with emotion. Um, so, you know, if they are, are places that you've been able to identify where you've been wounded, I just encourage you to say, Jesus, where were you in that moment? Um, and he will show up. Um, and that was really big for me. Um, and that helped me to find those prophetic promises for me um, of who I truly am and what my real identity is. So anyway. Thank you, Dina. Other practical ways. Okay. Well, it's uh, just a joy to hear from all of you. Uh, Steve said he had a strong impression as he was preparing his message today that he was not to finish the message that you were. And Steve, I want to commend you, uh, your church to you, got Jesus Church to you. Uh, I think we have some teachers and preachers here, and uh, I think our series is healthy. Uh, this is just beautiful as we encourage one another. It takes me back to what Don said as they were sharing their report of their trip to Asia, that our words are more important than we imagine. And as we talk about our uh, calling really flowing from who we are, from our identity, you've heard one another speak of a number of very practical things. Most of us know this, but we need to be reminded. Um, so if you were to, you know, I heard it several times, I'll share a screen, screen here real quickly here and then we'll close. But if you were to Google identity in Christ or who I am in Christ, you would find 472 versions of this right here. Can y'all see that? Somebody just say yes. Yeah, you're gonna find all kinds of those. and. And we don't do that, just go, yeah, oh yeah, that makes sense, amen. But as Steve said, and I've heard from a number of, of you, uh, the intentionality is so necessary uh, to be regular, consistent, intentional, out loud, uh, because the messages of the flesh, the devil, and the world are so prevalent, uh, so, so, what's the word? continuous that that we need to do that and so and i fear i'm using too many words now and um, one of my pet peeves is a, a re-preach after somebody preaches so well so i'll stop here um i would love melissa if you want to take a, a few seconds to gather your thoughts and and uh, close us with a blessing and a benediction uh, reminder to each of you we will be meeting tuesday evening in the sanctuary for prayer uh, thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, I think most of you were there, but uh, come on out. Uh, it's, your words are more important than you can imagine. Let's exercise those words Tuesday night as well. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Melissa? Yeah. Well, I'm just, my heart is so full that God had a plan to restore our relationship with him. And he spoke to us, communicated to us words of life from the very moment that mankind was created. So, Father, I want to thank you that your words are words of life. And Lord, I pray that this week, as we go through our week, that we would be reminded by you, Holy Spirit, of those words of life that we need to hear that we'd be reminded and we'd, we'd find that as we read the word this week. 
So Lord, may we be rich in knowing your word, applying your word. And as I think someone said, getting it from our head to our heart, Holy Spirit, would you do that work in us? Because we want to be more and more and more like you, Jesus. So Lord, I just pray a blessing on everyone that's here and on all those that weren't able to make it on the Zoom meeting today, that we would walk in your word, we'd have a life in your word, and Lord, you give us the words of life to share with those that are around us. Lord, we love you, and thank you for this time. In your name, amen. Amen. And so thank you, church. Uh, that concludes our, our worship session.